You'll remember, hopefully, that in the last episode of GM Word of the Week, we took the highly advanced step of attempting to explain what magic is as far as Dungeons and Dragons and similar role-playing games are concerned. First, we dispelled one of the great myths about magic just being advanced or improperly understood technology, and then we went to some lengths to understand the first of the two broad divisions of the magical world. Of course, this isn't to be taken as our endorsement of magic as a real and true effect in the world. And certainly, we don't want to muddy the waters by including performance or stage magic in the discussion, though it was important to clear up why it isn't included as part of coming up with a working definition of the sort of magic we did mean that we could all more or less agree on. See, performance magic is all solidly based on the way the natural world really works, but disguised with clever bits of trickery. And we decided that the first major division of magic is theurgy, or divine magic, and it was exemplified by the working of miracles and so forth by calling on an outside agency and asking nicely. In other words, invoking the will of someone or something else in order to get a thing done. In this way, we arrived at a definition that said the kind of magic we were going to talk about and examine more closely had to be both supernatural and an expression of the user's own will. Although we also agreed that some of that definition was going to come back and bite us before we were all through. At least it won't be our own fault. Which just leaves us with the second big division of magic, thaumaturgy. And of course, nothing could be simpler to deal with. I expect this will be our shortest episode ever, what with it being such a small, easily explained subject with hardly any room for deviation, absolutely no long convoluted history, and no huge concepts that need breaking down into easily digestible bits. We probably won't even have to break it into multiple parts in order to cover it all. Just by way of example of how easy this discussion will be, let's look at the etymology of the word magic. That's magic, M-A-G-I-C, not magic with any K's or Y's or other odd spellings, about which more later. For now, though, the English words mage, magician, and magic, all with a C, all come from the Latin term magus, which comes from the Greek magos, meaning magician, which in turn comes from Old Persian magu, and does not mean an old, nearsighted man who blunders through his day because he refuses to wear glasses. So far, so good. All easily understandable. Now for the tricky bits. Persian magu may have led to the old Chinese word for mage or shaman, and lent part of its meaning to Semitic and Talmudic magash, Aramaic amgusha, and Chaldean magdim, which meant wisdom and philosophy. And also Syrian magusai, meaning soothsayers in addition to everything else, which we think you'll agree is a lot of heavy lifting for a single Persian word to do. Still not impossible to fathom, but so far all we've dealt with is origins and meaning. The real problem is usage. See, in the 6th and 5th centuries BCE, which is why those dates are in reverse order, the ancient Greeks came up with the word goetia, which meant witchcraft or sorcery, and was meant to reflect fraudulent, unconventional, and dangerous rites, rituals, and practices in a negative way. Latin adopted this meaning by the 1st century BCE, and shortly thereafter, in the 1st century CE, the early Christian church picked up the meaning and began to use it whenever they talked about magic and witchcraft, and how it was associated with demons and so forth, and therefore against their religion and theology. See the Witch of Endor in the first book of Samuel in any convenient Bible. And no, she was not in Star Wars. Well, as time went on, and especially during the Middle Ages, the word magic soon came to include everything from incantations and divination to necromancy and astrology, and all of it was bad news as far as Christians were concerned. Even the Protestants, when they happened, used the term pejoratively when it came to discussing Roman Catholicism, pointing out that Catholic rituals and observances were no better than magic in the first place, and had little basis in what the Bible actually said. All that business with the beads, Hail Marys, and little swinging pots of smoke and so forth 
were at best incantations and poorly understood rituals, especially when it came to the understanding of the common man, so it might as well be magic for all the good it did. Naturally, as the world grew and Europeans began colonizing the world, any time they ran into a strange, to them, practice or belief, it got labeled as magic as well. But fortunately for everyone concerned, some Italians were busy explaining that some of the magic was actually okay, as it was simply a natural magic. Natural magic being the magic of nature, as embodied in rubbing rocks together and ingesting the right sort of herbs. But more on that later. So, on the one hand, you had people running around saying magic was bad, and on the other, different but similar people running around saying, no, but really some magic is okay and even good. Both ideas got mixed together and informed the current meaning of magic and what and how we think about it. Which is a state of affairs not helped by modern scholars and researchers. If you are trying to talk about the role of magic and how it relates to history and society, but are unable to agree fundamentally on what is even meant by the word magic, how it is supposed to work, who was allowed to practice it, and whether or not it was even a thing in the first place, you aren't going to get very far in your discussion before an argument breaks out, and the one person who does know about magic is too busy turning people into frogs to explain things. Some talk about it in terms of hidden sympathies. See our episode on Hermes. Some talk about it as the opposite of science, and others consider it to be the opposite of religion. After years of this sort of thing and much ribbiting about, most of the useful scholars realized that what magic really meant was nothing at all, because actually, honestly, no one had any clue what they were talking about anyway. It was all too confused and mixed up to discuss in any meaningful way. See? Easy. This is GM Word of the Week, and I'm Fiddleback. The worst part is, of course, that we all think we know what we mean when we say magic. We mean, you know, wand waving and uh, fireballs and disappearing things and turning people into frogs and, well, you know, magic things. When asked, it all seems so simple. But as discussed, it isn't. Almost immediately, I'm going to contradict some of the things I said last episode. For instance, even though I went to great lengths to make it clear that there are two big divisions of magic, and there are, I also have to admit that theurgy and thaumaturgy are not the only ways magic can be divided into large but manageable groups. You could, for example, divide magic into black magic, white magic, and the slightly more enigmatic gray magic. And immediately we know the difference between those, right? One is magic intended to harm, one is magic intended to help, and the third is magic that can't make up its mind what it wants to do. Easy enough, a couple hundred years of popular entertainment have helped drive those concepts home. Star Wars, for instance. Or perhaps you would like to divide magic into high and low magic. Slightly more obscure meanings attach in order to help separate the magic of ceremonies and rituals from the simpler magic of the peasantry as read about in folklore that relied on a few words and phrases. When they collide with each other, you end up with things like witch trials and burnings, as opposed to a handshake and an agreement to go their separate ways. The problem with both those alternate ways of dividing magic, though, is that neither one of them particularly relies on what is inherent in each category to define those categories, especially since white, black, and gray are modern terms developed in the 20th century to describe practices dating back thousands of years and say more about the person using the magic or applying the label than the magic itself. Which is why you need gray, because sometimes a thing can be white or black depending solely on intent of the user or perception of the observer, rather than anything about the magic being used itself. So anything that could fall into both categories goes into the third. And of course, the problem with high and low magic is that it isn't a division of the magic itself, but rather a division of the class of people using it. Anything in use by the church, for instance, was clearly high magic. 
How could it be otherwise? And anything in use by some little old lady in a shack by herself way out in the woods with nothing but a stray cat for company was obviously low magic. Isn't that obvious? Even though ritual was as much part of some low magic as the simple word or magical phrase was a part of high magic. Amen to that, brother. Fortunately, our division of magic into theurgy and thaumaturgy at least says something about where the power was supposed to come from. Theurgy was asking for a power outside the self to bend their will on your behalf, and thaumaturgy, as we discussed when coming up with our working definition, was an exercise of the user's own will. So thaumaturgy, and thus our working definition of magic, is using supernatural forces to manifest the user's own will. I make fireballs because I want to, and not because some deity has allowed me to. Strangely, there's no therapy for either of those two positions. The other place we're going to trip over our previous episode is in saying that divine magic is an entirely separate thing with no crossover into this episode at all. That is, of course, ridiculous and entirely wrong. It works in the sort of simplified world of Dungeons and Dragons, where there are actual mechanical rules that have to be implemented in consistent ways, and so some strict definitions are needed to guide that application. But any of you who have paid attention to recent editions of the game will quickly realize that even that doesn't apply anymore, thanks to D&D's ongoing efforts to appease everyone and let them play the way they want to play. That's all well and good but ultimately unhelpful when it comes time to actually talk about the way the game works. So if they can't accomplish perfect distinction in a game full of rules intended to provide such distinction so you know how things are supposed to be run, there's absolutely no hope for the real-world examples that have informed the game since the beginning in the first place. In truth, bits of divine magic are all over the supernatural self-willed kind of magic we want to discuss here. You're just going to have to accept that the real world is messy and refuses to fit into narrowly defined categories no matter what you are talking about, let alone something as convoluted and old as is magic. In fact, when it comes to the discussion of the history of magic, we have yet another insurmountable problem to overcome before we can even decide what the history of magic actually is. It's one of those 40 or so questions about magic you have to answer before you can even discuss what it is. And without it, you can't even have the discussion because magic wouldn't exist in the first place. See, magic requires two things to actually be magical beyond what our working definition even suggests. First and foremost, it requires someone to do something. Anything, really. It literally doesn't matter what the thing is. It just has to have someone who does it. Because the really, really important part is the second ingredient, which is that someone has to see the thing being done and not know how it happened. It's the one extra fact they don't know, as referenced in the quote at the very end of the last episode, which makes a thing magical. Someone has to be a bit dumb, or a bit fooled, or a bit confused, for magic even to exist. After all, if everyone knew how everything magical was done, it wouldn't be magic, it would just be a slightly more complicated way of doing things. If you don't know about migration, birds turn into fish in the winter and live in rivers. If you don't know about splitting atoms, nuclear bombs seem impossible. If you don't know about palming peas, the shell game is entirely inexplicable to you, and you are forced to assume the explanation for all of these things is... It's magic. So, in order to decide where the history of magic begins, we first have to decide when the first person was fooled by someone else doing something about which the observer did not know that one extra fact. Which puts the history of magic right there with the history of the wheel so far back that no one knows when that moment was, effectively lost to history. We're forced to assume it was some caveman or woman somewhere who just couldn't understand how Grunk managed to pull that bird bone out from behind their own ear. 
failing to notice he had it kept in his hand the whole time. Pure magic. Let's burn him at the stake as soon as we work out how to make fire. However, for our purposes, let's start in Mesopotamia. For most things lost to history, Mesopotamia is the first place where some sort of record of it turns up. Largely because Mesopotamia was pretty much the first place people started writing things down in ways that managed to survive to be discovered by other people. In Mesopotamia, magic took the form of rituals and medicine, with a brisk sideline in counteracting evil omens. See the Amulet episode for a discussion of the little trinkets used to ward off the evil eye and other such things. As far as the people of Mesopotamia were concerned, amulets and magic were the go-to cures for anything having to do with ghosts, demons, and other such evil. Heck, even dead people you had unknowingly wronged might be able to cast some sort of harmful magic against you, so you had to watch out for that as well. And so prevalent were curses cast by other magical practitioners that you'd better get a jump on it and not only have the curse being cast on you warded off, but cast one right back at them. Preferably preemptively. Of course, it just wasn't done to be seen to be casting curses on people. You could get in trouble for that, probably involving fire. But also, it was very, very good for business to be seen protecting people from curses especially if that person went on to live a happy and fulfilling life and not, say, get trampled to death by wheelless ox carts ten minutes after leaving your house of blessings. So harmful magic was cast in secret, but blessings and curse preventions were carried out in public for everyone to see. You could also try burying little figures of the people tormenting you while saying a few words meant to protect you from them. Or you could attempt to transfer sins you might have accidentally and unwittingly committed to other objects and burn them to rid yourself of the impurity. And of course, you could even get love spells for those especially troublesome relationships that weren't quite working out the way you had hoped. See our episode on love potions for more on the power dynamics involved. All of which is to say that in Mesopotamia, bad things happened to good people, and it was hard to explain why. And with so much uncertainty laying about, maybe curses and magic and amulets and such could help you avoid it all. Which was very good for the magical practitioners of the day, or rather for their business and reputations. It was an opportunity not to pass up, and an asipu would help you out. Or in, as the case may be. In fact, asipus were not only magic users, they also likely acted as doctors, priests, scribes, and the sorts of people who just generally know most things of a technical nature and could probably teach it to someone else. Which they did, most especially to their own children, passing the knowledge down through generations and ensuring its perpetuation. They were highly revered, and no good Mesopotamian worth his salt failed to have one on some sort of retainer. Which is fine. Everyone wants their own pocket magic user. Or in fact, magic bowl. Because in Mesopotamia, if what you really wanted was to make sure you and your family were safe from demons and angry or evil spirits, you'd take a woven bowl and bury it upside down somewhere around the house or grave of the recently dead. That way, if you owed them money, or you'd been unkind to their children, or maybe you just borrowed their lawnmower and forgot to give it back, if they tried to come after you from the afterlife, they'd be caught in the bowl and unable to escape it and harm you. Of course, preventing things from going wrong with those in the afterlife was the main focus of another different ancient civilization. In fact, it is very nearly the thing they are best known for. The ancient Egyptians were so adamant about having a successful afterlife they piled up great big bricks in the middle of the desert to let folks know how they really felt about it for years to come. Fortunately, the Egyptians kept excellent records, and thanks to numerous surviving tomb carvings and burial goods, we've got a fairly good idea about how magic fit into their lives. Or rather, their afterlives. For the Egyptians, magic was personified as the god Heka, and as such was closely entwined with their religion and culture. So much so that Heka is not only the name of the god, it's the word for magic in ancient Egypt, and became the root for other words that mean magic in subsequent cultures and belief traditions 
that derived from Egypt as well. See, the ancient Egyptians thought of Heka as a morally neutral force with wide application. Neither good nor bad, it was just something that existed that anyone could make use of, just like air and water and gravity. You didn't even have to be Egyptian to make use of and be influenced by the use of Heka. It applied equally to everyone, no matter their personal beliefs, homeland, or station in life. Anyone could use it for any application as they saw fit. The principle of Heka applied to all. And what was that principle, you might well ask? Well, it had to do with the power of words. Words, it has been said more than once, mean things. However, according to Heka, words not only meant things, words could bring things into being. Know the right words, and you, like the Egyptian gods and the Egyptian creation myths, could create the entire world. And since humans, in the Egyptian view, were but one or two steps removed from being gods themselves, it was perfectly reasonable to assume that humans could be just as creative, in the bringing things into being sense, as the gods themselves had been. Say the right words, and the world was the mollusk of your choice. But the real major force of Egyptian magic, and the one you've no doubt heard of over and over again in various horror films, action movies, and gothic-inspired tales of suspense, is the Egyptian Book of the Dead, which contains within its name a bit of a lie. See, there is no book as such. What there is instead is a series of hieroglyphs and tomb inscriptions containing numerous spells intended to aid the dead in crossing into the afterlife and prepare them for the journey. The pyramid texts, as they are known, are a series of hundreds of magical spells covering the interior walls of the Pyramid of Unas, last of the pharaohs of the 5th dynasty. They are inscribed into the walls in floor-to-ceiling vertical columns and they are all intended to help the pharaohs survive in the afterlife. They were meant to be secret and sacred for the use of pharaohs only, but when tomb robbers broke into the pyramid, they quickly spread to the common folk, who then began writing the spells inside their much more humble coffins, hoping to ease their own passage to the afterlife. These became known as the coffin texts. Together, these two texts, neither written on anything even remotely like a book, form the beginning of the Book of the Dead, or as the Egyptians called it, the Book of Coming Forth by Day, or Emerging Forth into the Light. Well, once you properly translate the title, of course. Really, what the Book of the Dead was, was a loose collection of texts painted onto various objects and not written out on papyrus. These things had to survive quite the trip and an entire afterlife, after all, and Papyrus was known to be a little short in the longevity department. They would be placed inside a coffin, along with suitable coffin texts and various protective amulets, as well as accompanying pyramid texts inscribed on the walls, all with the hope that the deceased would happily stay that way and enjoy the afterlife so much there wouldn't be any reason to come back and harass the family. The collection of spells used for the Book of the Dead was ancient, some dating as far back as the 3rd millennium BCE, which, for reference, is at least as far back in the BCEs as we are ahead in the CEs. And there was no one version of the book. Some 192 different spells are known to exist, and each book used a selection of those spells tailored to perceived needs of the soon-to-be traveler to the afterlife. Each spell would be decorated with its own illustration and had numerous uses. Some were like travel permits, allowing the deceased to go out into the day, pass down into the netherworld, and travel the various roads on the way to the afterlife. They even include a note from the priest, allowing the dead to get off any work anyone might be expecting them to do while dead, and a further one stipulating that someone else was duly authorized to do the work for this very important dead person instead. Naturally, with all the mummification going on, there were spells to protect various organs, particularly the heart, spells to allow the dead to speak on their own behalf in the great beyond while their heart was being weighed up for entry, and even a spell to help the dead remember their name, with their brains being scrambled out of their skulls and all. 
It was a dangerous journey, too. Spells protected the dead from numerous crocodiles, snakes, insects, hostile animals in general, another bigger donkey-eating snake, demons, decapitation, rotting, being jostled out of line, having to spend the afterlife upside down, dying a second time while already dead, and most importantly of all, not eating or drinking any of the things you'd much rather have flushed away. Of course, that implies you could eat or drink in the afterlife, which you could only do if your priest remembered to include spells that permitted that sort of activity, along with breathing, having power over water, and not being burnt or scalded. And certainly, you wouldn't want to have your soul unexpectedly repossessed as you were journeying along, so there was a spell to protect against that, too. With the right spells, the deceased could change into any one of several shapes, some of which would let you come back to the world of the living by day. There were spells for becoming either a divine falcon or one of gold, a lotus, a phoenix, heron, swallow, or presumably, if you had plans for keeping your ex-wife out of the afterlife, snakes and crocodiles. And if you just wanted to cut to the chase and get it all done at once, why not have a spell just to make you a god with the power to give light and darkness? As far as magical texts go, the Book of the Dead had pretty much everything the Traveler in the Afterlife could possibly need, and if you'd like to see a fine example of one which is, granted, written out on a papyrus scroll, look up the Papyrus of Annie at the British Museum. Which is, of course, where the Egyptians prefer to store their significant historical artifacts. In 1888, some unsavory local people were busy robbing a tomb when they happened upon the papyrus, and this being 1888, and there being a lot of itinerant British hanging about looking for historically significant Egyptian things they could buy or steal and run back to Britain with, they decided to sell it on. It's just what the British did back then for light entertainment. Don't worry, it was completely fair. They were doing it everywhere at the time. Rome, Greece, you name it. There was nothing the British of the time liked more than other people's things. Anyway, the Egyptian authorities somehow got wind of the whole thing and locked up a bunch of antiquities dealers, sealed up their house, and put it all under guard. Well, a man named E.A. Wallace Budge had already paid quite a princely sum for the papyrus and a few other little trinkets he fancied, and wasn't about to just let the Egyptians have them back simply because they'd prevented the theft. So Budge distracted the guards, were told by offering them a dinner, while some of his confederates dug under the walls of the house and stole it all back. Which is a heck of a dinner to be distracted by, one would think. Probably a giant roast camel with extra dipping sauce or something. He then sent it all off to the British Museum as fast as he could, and the rest is all someone else's history. A history which has much much more to go before we arrive where we want to be. I told you there was a lot to cover, and by golly, we're going to cover it. There's still Judea, Greece, and Rome to go. And then all of the Middle Ages, the Renaissance, and eventually something a bit more modern. Because it all matters to what Dungeons & Dragons was trying to do with its magic system. And is still trying to do. With varied success. Until next time. Thanks for listening to this episode of GEM Word of the Week. Nope, it's not really on any schedule at the moment. They'll come out when and as they are ready. Hopefully at least two a month, but I'm definitely not making any promises. Might be more, might be less, but they are coming. So hang in there and enjoy them as they show up. Figuring out where to split things up has been one of the hardest parts. This episode is a Fiddleback production and was researched, written, and produced by Brian Casey. Find more episodes at gmwordoftheweek.com and follow the show on Twitter at Fiddleback. That's right, I've closed the old GM Word of the Week Twitter feed. It's all under one roof now.
You can help support the show at buymeacoffee.com slash fiddleback with both one-time and ongoing pledges. And I'd like to take this opportunity to once again thank everyone who stuck by the show during its absence. It's much appreciated. For those of you wavering about supporting, there's always the bookmobile level at $2 a month. Or individual grants of coffee. Every little helps. Music is provided by Blue Dot Sessions, home of minimalist acoustic music for production and pleasure. Visit them at sessions.blue. A world in which elves exist and magic works offers greater opportunities to digress and explore. 